Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be here again for the uh, colloquium. Uh, my wife Virginia and I at the back there was, uh, have always enjoyed these tremendously and uh, uh, interrupted as they were by COVID and other things. Um, it's uh, very good to be able to be back and to be with David and all of you again. So thank you for, for being here. Um, the theme of this paper uh, is a contrast between two forms of humanism. One is Christian, which is transcendental and incarnational, reflective of God's life in the Trinity as creator and saviour. The other form of humanism I'll be discussing is secular, which is human confined and world bound. And these two forms provide a contrast of source and inspiration, I think, and also a contrast in consequences and outcomes. I'd like to explore this contrast by drawing on the insights of Christopher Dawson, after whom this, this centre, um, thanks to his grace, has been very appropriately named. Uh, his insights, particularly into these two philosophies, their impact on history, and their meaning for present day culture. Let me approach this, uh, Dawson's historical insights by putting them in the context of his early life. He was born in the closing years of the 19th century and he was 80 years old when he died in 1970. He grew up in a settled religious culture that was Anglican and a traditional rural culture that was both English and Welsh. He attended Winchester College, one of Britain's oldest public schools, and then he went to Oxford University. Though he admitted in a private letter to a friend that, quote, he got nothing from the school, little from Oxford, and less than nothing from the post-Victorian urban culture. His cultural formation actually came from what he called that much derided Victorian rural home life, which was deeply rooted in tradition. I'd like to point to two important experiences briefly during his school and university years, which helped to shape his understanding of humanism. One occurred while he was at Winchester College, when he used to visit the cathedral at Winchester, one of the largest and oldest Gothic cathedrals in Europe. Even Richard Dawkins is now on record as saying he likes to listen to the bells from Winchester Cathedral. But Dawson recalled that he learnt more from these visits and than from the formal religious instruction he received at school. So at this early age, I think he came to appreciate in the most concrete and incarnational way the transcendental inspiration of religious culture in his own land. He saw these cultural realities embodied in the monuments of great historical figures as the cathedral contained the tombs of Saxon kings and medieval statesmen bishops who combined secular power and religious symbolism in their roles as monarchs and church leaders. Later, and this was a second experience I just want to mention, a notable one I think, he visited while he was at Oxford, the city of Rome at Easter time. He was then only 19 years old. The eternal city came, he said, as a revelation to him. It opened his eyes, he later recalled, to a new world of religion and culture, which was, as you'd know, the, the great continuing theme of his historical works. He visited one particular church, Ara Chaley, built on the site of a former pagan temple and had links with the Roman Emperor Augustus. And this brought home to him a profound impression of the continuity of history and the transformative power of religion, how a vibrant faith had gradually converted a dying civilization that of pagan Rome, into the new and vital civilization of Christianity. 
Well, I've highlighted these personal experiences of Dawson because I think they shed light on how his understanding of a transcendental humanism actually developed. He saw the pathways in history by which the Christian faith had transformed the conception of human life and thereby transformed the nature of the culture so that the circumstances, the experiences, the very meaning of human life came to be viewed through the lens of a divine purpose and an eternal destiny. Now, this perspective informed all his historical writings, which came over the years to shed the light of historical learning on Lord Acton's famous dictum, religion is the key to history. Religion is the key to history. Dawson saw history as the arena in which religious faith and cultural activity interact, and that it's always been a spiritual impulse a spiritual longing and striving and search for meaning that moved human beings to be at once creative and collaborative in the life of culture. As Dawson moved into the 1930s, a very turbulent decade, and succeeding decades, he saw with piercing clarity, I think, what happens when this spiritual impulse is ignored or denied, as in a secularised culture, or else channeled into false causes, such as political and imperial crusades or economic idolatry? And how destructive, especially self-destructive, these utopian fantasies turn out to be. Well, probably the most common setting of humanism in history and in theology and literature has been that of the city. In the case of Christian humanism, Dawson saw the centrality of the city of Rome, first as the centre of the vast Roman Empire into which Christianity had entered and by which it spread across the empire, and second as a centre of symbolic importance in that it had long occupied, has long occupied a crucial place in the cultural imagination and memory of the people. In several essays of historical reflection, Dawson highlighted these two points of importance, historical and symbolic. The city of Rome is the historical setting of Christianity and the city itself being a symbol of Christian humanism in thought and in action, revealing the Christian vision of human life and destiny. In the fourth century, for example, the fourth century, Dawson noted the Spanish Christian poet, Prudentius, saw an exalted purpose in the historical dominance of Rome. He believed, and I quote Dawson, that there was a providential connection between the Roman ideal of world unity and the higher spiritual unity of the Christian church. So in God's plan, an organic connection had been forged between two cultures. The pagan one actually prepared the way for the Christian one. There was the geographical spread of an ancient civilization that was materially impressive politically powerful and animated by certain noble ideas, but was spiritually dying. And there was the religious conversion of that old world civilization that gave birth to a new civilization in both the East and the West, built upon the transcendental promise of the Christian gospel. By the fifth century, as the empire was collapsing, Augustus, Augustine sorry, saw Rome historically in a negative light as a product of human pride and ambition. The triumph of a material civilization that had lost its spiritual purpose and was so decayed from within that it was doomed in the face of the barbarian invasions from the north. 
And yet, Augustine captured the symbolic significance of the city, I think, as a humanist center in the title of his magisterial work, The City of God. Here he unfolded a vision of two cities, the city of God and the city of man. And he expressed the Christian understanding of humanism in terms of a twofold citizenship. What human beings inherit when living in an eternal city governed by a loving God and what their experience becomes if it's confined to the city of man and is trapped by the values of that city, its false and ego-promoting values, which inevitably seek to be ego-rewarding as well. There's a further insight into Christian humanism that I always found illuminating in Christopher Dawson's works, and that is how impressively he sheds light, light on its unique character and that is its vital blending of what I'd mentioned at the beginning of the transcendental and the incarnational. Christian humanism, as Dawson pointed out, recognises, of course, the religious value of contemplation and mystical experience. But it's also founded on incarnation, the incarnation of Christ. And thus it is related directly and deeply to our secular and earthly experience, as well as our eternal calling and destiny. I think this accounts for the fact that its cultural expressions have a sacramental quality. That is, that the Christian faith imparts a spiritual meaning and dignity to material realities, so that rather than being obstacles or distractions to the spiritual life, and spiritual redemption, they actually become pathways to our redemption and our reconciliation with God. In addition, they tend to be local and particular in the customs and the rituals, the art, the architecture and so on, while at the same time they preserve an underlying connection with the centre and remain vitalised by it the English writer and publisher Maisie Ward, the wife of Frank Shee, the great Australian writer and publisher, once noted, I quote, Christianity is universal, it is in every country, but because it is sacramental, it's intensely local, found in each country in a special and unique fashion. Well, Dawson was always alive, I think, to the two levels of cultural expression of faith, which make his works of such enduring value and continue to shed light on this great question of humanism. They shed light, firstly, on the universal and sacramental nature of Christianity, a blending of the transcendental and the incarnational, the eternal, and the local. On the one hand, there is the higher level, as we might determine, of intellectual reflection and dissemination, as in a university, of prayerful elevation and absorption, as in a monastery, and of artistic capture, as in a painting or a musical masterpiece. On the other hand, there is the ordinary level of religious belief and practice, popular pieties and rituals, expressed most obviously in personal devotions like the rosary and in community festivals and pilgrimages. Now these two levels come together in a Christian culture, which reconciles, reconciles I think, the obvious tensions between these higher and ordinary levels by the power of spiritual integration. We see this, for example, with the year-round devotional self-denials of the monks and the daily rhythm of their prayer life and the seasonal fasts 
such as ordinary people uh, during Lent learning to live without chocolate or even more horrible to contemplate without alcohol. <laughs> Dawson recognised that spiritual devotion, which seems to involve withdrawal or denial, in fact is culturally positive and fruitful. And he put it in this way, and I quote, in Christianity, the tendency to a world renouncing asceticism coexists with a tendency towards social and cultural activity. And it's the tension of these two forces that has given Christianity its characteristic power to change society and to create new cultural forms. Now, one expression of this insight of the blending of the transcendental and the incarnational that I've long found thought-provoking is a book by the French Jesuit scholar and later cardinal, um, uh, a later cardinal, Jean Danielou. And it's called Prayer as a Political Problem. Prayer as a Political Problem. Danielou focuses on the intersection of the secular and the sacred and points out that no civilization can finally survive if it does not provide room for adoration. He argues that it's part of the responsibility of politics as a secular activity to provide for the sacred, not in an intrusive or commanding fashion, but in terms of creating the conditions the human and social conditions in which adoration becomes possible and accessible for ordinary people. A society must have churches as well as factories if it is to have, in Daniel Liu's words, a full material, fraternal and spiritual life. If it fails to provide for, or worse, it denies, this fundamental human need to adore, which is essentially, I think, a transcendental hunger, then it will be inhuman. It will be failing to fulfil a key function of politics, and that is the building and the sustaining of conditions that allow for the full flourishing of human beings. In that sense, prayer is a political problem as Danny Liu entitles his book. But as we know, it's no longer a political problem today as such, even if it troubles our parliaments occasionally as they debate whether to recite the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of their sessions. Prayer is no longer considered relevant or helpful to politics, or more broadly, to the life of culture. Spiritual truths and values are not recognised as real in a secularised culture. As the transcendental struggles to be incarnated in Western society, to find cultural embodiment, the spiritual life is now meant to be private, not public, personal, not cultural. As a result, Secular humanism, the conception of what a human being is, what is important or valuable about him in a secular context, has become essentially disembodied. It cannot find firm and enduring cultural expression. It lurches, I think, from one cultural fashion to another. Trying to find clothes it will be at home in, but each fashion proves as illusory and hadn't satisfying as the one before. I suppose the most obvious consequence of secular humanism, no longer inspired by a transcendental vision that is human-centred and confined, is that it will inevitably become self-absorbed and prone to narcissism. It will inevitably become self-idolising 
and lack any capacity to combat the tendency to being self-righteous. I think these qualities of self-righteousness and narcissism are on full display in contemporary culture. To my mind, however, the most significant feature of contemporary humanism is its contradictions. I think it abounds in contradictions. We might, in a Chestertonian sense, be more kind and say paradoxes. But, and it's rooted in its being man-centred, but divorced from God, if not rejecting of God. The late American Catholic author Walker Percy described the basic and agonising contradiction in his 1971 novel, Love in the Ruins. And he described it in these terms, as the Christ forgetting, Christ haunted, death dealing Western world. The Christ forgetting, Christ haunted, death dealing Western world. Our culture, I think, is prone to exalting certain values while at the same time demeaning and distorting them. Thus, we're deeply inclined to promote life at the expense of death, by which I mean avoiding and even denying death, so that our culture no longer teaches us how to face death as an inescapable reality and to give it any real meaning. This has become evident in our use of language. We've come to soften our choice of words to the point where we obscure the seriousness of death and therefore whether it has any ultimate meaning or purpose. We speak not of somebody dying, but of passing. Even passing away, I think, is now much less used. And yet at the same time, we're urged to promote death through euthanasia, again disguising it in our language by referring to assisted dying when we actually mean assisted suicide. Again, another contradiction is how we abhor suicide as a tragic act that we struggle to prevent, and at the same time we promote suicide as acceptable, even irresistible, through the legalisation of euthanasia. A further contradiction, I think, is our attitude to nature. We exalt and even reverence nature in the physical environment, so that we wish to leave nature as it exists, undisturbed and unexploited. Yet we no longer extend this reference of nature, this reverence of nature, to human nature, which is regarded as, as endlessly changeable and exploitable, whether through drugs or surgery or other interventionist strategies, especially now with the transgender movement. The truth that finally prevails is this, I think, that if we obey nature, it will serve us, but if we abuse nature, it will destroy us. Well, the final contradiction I'd like to highlight is that we exalt safety and protection, the compelling need to be safe. As we experienced most recently during the COVID pandemic, being safe was the overriding mantra enforced in Australia, especially, I think, and elsewhere, certain countries, by totalitarian type measures, lockdowns and curfews and border closures that were damaging to the community at a time when the loss of community is already deeply felt in our society and also injurious to mental health when mental health and mental problems were already at alarming levels. In relation to the safety of children, we rightly abhor child abuse. Though this is usually seen in terms of sexual misbehaviour, rather than as extending to cultural abuse, the way that our culture not only allows sexual abuse, 
by its early sexualization of children, but is passive in allowing the broader abuse often caused by social media. At the same time, we continue to render early childhood unsafe by destroying infants in the womb. Now, Christopher Dawson always recognised the profound significance of ideas and their impact on culture and history, how they pave the way for social and political change and give expression to the aspirations and the fears of ordinary people. Thus, in his 1959 book, The Movement of World Revolution, which was published uh, while Dawson was at Harvard University as the first professor of Catholic studies there, Dawson probed the intellectual revolution that preceded the social and political upheaval of the French Revolution in the 18th century. And he identified the immense influence of the philosophers of Descartes and Rousseau on the French Revolution. Descartes' exaltation of pure reason and Rousseau's assertion of the rights of man. One detached the faculty of reason, the other detached the cause of humanism from the transcendental Christian roots which had formed and elevated these. And these uncouplings prepared the ground for the secular humanism of our time. But then, as revolutions have historically done, they end tragically. They consume their own children. In the case of the French Revolution, Dawson pointed out that the hopes of the liberal idealists of that time, such as Lafayette, that the revolution would realise the ideals of the 18th century rationalist enlightenment, of liberty and toleration and human rights, that these hopes were soon to be shattered. They did not see, and I quote Dawson now, that they were on the edge of a precipice and that the world they knew was about to be swallowed up in a tempest of change which would destroy both them and their ideals. And so in a pithy conclusion, Dawson said, the revolution, which was the child of the Enlightenment, also proved to be its destroyer. Again, we might note Dawson's emphasis on the inspiration of powerful ideas in the French Revolution in this case, and how they assume great spiritual power, become like a religion. And he coined the term democratic mysticism, democratic mysticism, to capture this high quality of revolutionary idealism the mutual reinforcement of the intellectual and the spiritual, which injects such a radical and usually utopian quality into secular humanism. I think it helps to explain the deepest tendency of secular humanism. And that is, while shunning the principle of transcendence, it actually ends up adopting it and this leads to a marked feature of our time, the repeated emergence of what I'll call transcendental substitutes. Dawson saw the rise of modern etiologies of various kinds as the basis of transcendental substitutes, whether they be those of the last century, such as communism and Nazism, or of our time, as it's become wokeism. Each embodiment, each movement embodies a disguised form of transcendental humanism. Each reflects a vision of the human that is defective and ultimately destructive, I think. For it conceives of man as essentially a creature of human construction and therefore can find no way, finally, of safeguarding the human. 
This is whether he's seen as a creature of class, as in communism, or a creature of race, as in Nazism, or a creature of social and political discrimination, as in modern secular humanism, uh, infected by identity politics. Human beings become divided between victims and oppressors, depending on the preferred group or the despised one. They're not conceived anymore in the Christian understanding as spiritual creatures divided by good and evil. The line of separation, as Solzhenitsyn put it, passing not through states or classes or political parties, but through every human heart. Dawson put forward a distinction which reveals the fatal weakness of these different forms of contemporary humanism. It's a distinction between an etiology and a faith. An etiology, Dawson pointed out, is intended to fulfill the same sociological functions as a faith, but it does not correspond to a genuine transcendental reality. Etiologies are a product of frustrated or ignored spiritual cravings and rapidly become an instrument of political will. So the yearning for transcendence does not go away. It just finds secular causes to convert into transcendental crusades. In Walker Percy's words, again, when our culture becomes Christ-forgetting, it becomes Christ-haunted. And it harnesses the cause of humanism accordingly. Well, a further Dawson insight, and that is how early he saw the totalitarian tendencies of transcendental substitutes. He realised that the countries of the West, assumed to be democratic, would gradually become totalitarian and that this condition would no longer be confined to the politically totalitarian nations of, say, communist Russia or Nazi Germany, but rather um, that um, the, the essence of totalitarianism, in his judgment, did not lie in dictatorships, but rather in the cultural phenomenon of mass consciousness and mass organisation. And that these tendencies would lead not just to extreme social and political controls, but to the domination of people's minds and souls. In wartime books, such as one called Beyond Politics that he published in 1939, just as the Second World War was beginning, and several years later, The Judgment of the Nations, 1943, Dawson discerned the mass conditioning of modern totalitarianism. And I think he foresaw, at this early stage, the pervasive impact it would have on contemporary humanism, our conception of the human being, through the mass conformity it would bring about and that this would be reinforced by the seductive and all-absorbing impact of mass suggestion through media. And at that time, of course, Dawson had only the power of radio and occasional newsreels to base his insight on. In the final chapter of a later book, The Crisis of Western Education, Dawson argued that the technological order that Western man created had now advanced beyond his control. Technologies are especially vulnerable to the manipulations of power. They're essentially amoral and they tend to end up destroying basic moral values. 
Dawson perceived this imbalance between the technological order and the moral order long before the rise of the internet and the pervasiveness of electronic communication that we're so familiar with in the 21st century. And he thought that transcendental substitutes, whether political or economic or social, were finally illusory and could not bear the psychological and cultural weight being placed on them, nor could they provide any lasting fulfilment for the individual or the community. So to conclude, is there any promising and authentic way forward? Well, the only way, in Dawson's judgment, was to revitalise the two great spiritual forces that had inspired the development of Western civilization. One was the religious tradition of Christianity, and the other was the intellectual tradition of humanism. Now, when these spiritual forces are fused, they produce great cultural as well as spiritual fruits in learning, in science, in literature, in art, architecture, music, in social harmony and creativity. But when these forces are sundered, as in the modern and even more the postmodern West, religion declines and humanism degenerates and the transcendental sources of our culture dry up. The only way back is not a nostalgic return to the past in the restoration of a lost culture, but rather to rediscover the dynamic tradition of Christian humanism that has faded and is now beset by cultural amnesia on the one hand and ideological distortions and denials on the other. And to give it new life by revealing again its essential dignity and beauty. I think of the three transcendentals, truth, goodness and beauty. It is now beauty, in Dostoevsky's words, that will save the world. Truth and goodness have been subjectivised and relativised almost beyond recognition in our culture. But beauty, I think, can still inspire, and probably our culture now calls out to be inspired even more than convinced. Thank you very much. <laughs>